Good evening. I think this is a couple of sessions before uh, we close the day. But I think let's make it very engaging and interactive. The topic itself is very interesting. I think all of us, the most of the D2C brands here and one with me here, everyone is working on customer acquisition and acquisition. But retention is as important as acquisition. A lot of people are putting money is on acquiring new customers. But let me tell you, 5% retention can increase the top line by about 70 to 80%. So very important to focus around retention. And today we have, you know, representation from all categories, major categories. Uh, the esteemed panelists cover food, fashion, uh, beauty, Salon and wellness, and of course, travel gear. So, uh, let me start with everyone. If you can uh, introduce yourself uh, from uh, Paul uh, about what you've been doing uh, about your brand and also, uh, you know, around customer retention in your business. Any, uh, if you have some examples to share uh, with some numbers, it will be great. Hi, I'm Joseph Paul George. I represent Wisme. So we are a women's ethnic wear and lingerie brand. We have 35 stores across South India, predominantly offline first. We are also in the online space, but yeah, offline was where we started and where we, you know, improved on ourselves. So like you said, in terms of customer retention for us, being an offline brand that moved to online, we had to uh, look into a lot of nuances between the two. So one area I feel helped a lot is consistency in the product and the kind of, uh, let's say, offers or anything that's run to a certain extent. It shouldn't be entirely the same, but let's say the inventory. One is we follow an omnichannel inventory model. So let's say you go offline, you see a product, you can buy that exact same product online, it'll be available. You go online, you like a product, but you want to try it or you want to feel it. You want to see what the work is, you want to see the more intricate details, you come offline and that same product will be there. So I think that helped us to a large extent. Uh, another critical thing we realize is customer service. So let's say a customer buys online, but they should be able to return it offline. Now the teams between customer service of offline, online, and the store staff, as well as the back-end team, they all need to be in a coordinated method where if the customer, when they come, they're not gonna give you a lot of time. They're gonna come to the store, they have a few minutes. If you, know, you annoy them, they're out, that's it. That's probably the last time they come. So that coordination has to be quite perfect over there. Uh, another thing that helped with customer retention was, let's say you come to our store, we, uh, a size is not there. So you, have, you like this kurti and you really wanna buy it, but there's no size XL, it got sold out. So now we follow a model where we can immediately get that delivered online to your house from there itself. Because you can try out any other product, make sure the size is fitting, make sure you know, everything is perfect for you, and then, this is the design you want though. So we'll just send that across to your house. Or if even that's not comfortable, we'll get it delivered to this store within the next two days. And the next time you visit the store, you come back in a few days, we can get it delivered, whichever is comfortable for you. Uh, another thing is consistency in the brand experience. So when you go offline and when you go online, the tone of speaking, including the mail you're sending, including the customer service, including the store stuff, it has to sound similar and it has to convey the same culture, the same value, the, the attitude also, everything, while it's very minute, a tone of voice in a mail would be enough for the customer to feel like, okay, this is not, you know, it's not consistent. So yeah, I think these are some of the things that helped us. Thanks. So hi, uh, I'm Kanchan Shah and I represent Brand Concept. So Brand Concept is a manufacturing and a licensee business. We license Tommy Travel Gear, uh, United Colors of Benetton, Aeropostal, and uh, Juicy Couture are the few to mention. Uh, we also have about private labels under the Vertical and the Sugar Rush. So we predominantly in the travel gear and a handbag section. Uh, we operate omni-channel. Uh, we are having a presence on uh, all the e-commerce marketplaces as well as our own D2C site under the name Bagline. And we have a stores also, 45 stores, with the name Bagline in the predominantly all tier one and tier two cities. Uh, for us, what is this actually makes a 
customer retention has a lot of value because uh, you know buying travel gear or a luggage has a lot of seasonality involved to it when it is a holiday season it has a good peak but how do you convert that same customer to buy a backpack or a belt and a wallet also make a lot of sense to us so looking at the data uh, looking at what he will be probably buying will also help us to determine how my merchandising or uh, how my SKU or inventory at the store level. To give a seamless experience, we also have in a key flagship store, Endless Isle. From, uh, from the store, you can browse the website and see what new collection is in, and probably you can order directly from there. Uh, so these are the few things that we do, and of course, what matters is a customer experience, which is seamless, which also Paul mentioned about it. So these are a few things which uh, always make a customer to come back, welcome him with his own uh, personally inviting him rather than looking at just a data point that makes a very difference to a customer so these are the few things that we do thanks Sagar you've been representing a snack brand which is tax food uh, very interesting category uh, if you can introduce yourself and how have you been working on retaining a customer for a snacking brand with so many FMCG players uh, in the market. So uh, I represent uh, Tax Foods. Uh, it's a urban snack brand. Uh, premium uh, snack brand, you can say, crafting kind of you know better for you experiences. Basically mainstream categories, but providing similar products, not trying to change the habit of the consumers. In the same category, trying to give a better option for consumers. Uh, our first product was pop chips. I think we were the first brand to do that in India, uh, completely indigenously. Uh, other innovative products that we have launched is um, uh, a hemp based center filled cookie, uh, multivitamin chicki. We have uh, done uh, corn bujia for the first time in India. So, so multiple products that we have kind of worked on. Um, uh, our journey has been interesting in four years. You can say that from a only D2C, we have now kind of transitioned to completely general trade. Uh, we have seen a bits of, you know, modern trade, uh, you know, standalone modern trade, but now our primarily, you know, focus is on uh, general trade. That, you know, focus geographies, majorly south uh, and little bit of west, trying to go deeper there, and uh, little bit of e-commerce again, quick commerce, but since we have moved from a completely premium pricing point to a general trade pricing point of five and 10 rupees. So we are still kind of, you know, rebuilding ourselves on uh, quick commerce channels with, you know, the price points which fit in <laughs> to that model. So I think yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of interesting uh, journey and learning uh, for us as well, because what we have realized is that uh, snacking, at least in, in, in food also, you know, the groceries is, is, it performs very differently, you know, the matrices are very different. Snacking per se, we feel is is kind of a low involvement category when, when you say chips or a, or a cookie or something. So how we see, uh, you know, ourselves is that adoption possibly, you know, it's, it's going to come from your affordability and availability. Affordability is something that we realize is very important in Indian market. I think consumers are sensitive with even a five rupee kind of price change or something. Uh, which is which is kind of you know uh, something that we are also kind of trying to make consumers aware that you know this is something that is going in your stomach so maybe you know there can be a premium that you can pay for uh, something better going in but uh, five and ten rupees is what we are operating it in, in in general trade so in that market it's more about you know what what is available what you see is is what consumers are going to you know easily pick it up so we try to be in in the in the in the you know range where a person can pick it themselves and the uh, you know shopkeeper does not have to kind of give it to you so i think adoption comes from affordability and availability then the taste comes you know kind of you know contributes to the repeat that you know second time consumer will buy because you know they loved the taste or it is at par with the uh, industry leader or whatever the benchmark that they kind of you know evaluate retention comes from the value that you have created it's possibly going to come from third or fourth time that we have realized and in our case, you know, we provide a better for you option. So like, you know, similarly, like in a chips, uh, we have given a pop chips option, which is at par in taste with maybe your fried chips, but it is 60% less in fat. Uh, again, in hemp uh, center filled cookie, there is a element of a superfood that we have kind of brought in. Similarly, we are reducing or you removing palm oil in a couple of other products, which, you know, other players are kind of, you know, working with the palm oil model. So 
after a third or fourth kind of you know uh, you know instance of you know purchasing because they loved the taste is when they kind of you know start associating themselves with the brand that okay i am getting something better uh, at the same price at the same grammage in the in the kind of you know whatever nearest store or something so in all these factors you know the availability and visibility plays a very very critical role secondly i feel that quality consistency in quality and uh, uh, you know this is this is something that is again very critical in the food uh, industry when you say quality it also involves that you know the taste profile is similar it does not change you know with every batch or something you know it is very hygienic and all those kind of things so uh, that is something that you know we, we we have realized that you know plays a very very important role and lastly the omni channel pre presence has helped us you know because uh, like for an example uh, we started with cred maybe you know like we give it at a discount of say 70% off now the consumer will try it out then you know maybe second time you know they love the taste so what they will do is they will think that okay still i am not sure i'll still buy it on a discount they'll look for a discount they'll again possibly go on a channel where there is a discount happening they'll buy it again so after two times they will possibly start feeling that you okay i am comfortable with the brand i will buy it if it is available anywhere else so there the 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 point comes that you should be available on a channel so while the quick commerce gives us that that you know you tried it out from cred then you kind of you know started purchasing from your uh, uh, any of the uh, quick commerce channels then you went to a nearby store then also you find it there so that recalls keeps on happening at multiple <coughs> touch points and that is where you know the retention kind of starts coming in for a for a low involvement category like us so that is what we have been kind of experiment and uh, experimenting and you know playing out and uh, still learning interesting i think uh, because the category uh, itself is a very challenging but i think what you are doing interesting thanks niharika hello everybody good evening my name is niharika i am the founder of a personal care brand by the name of Marceline. We make happy, fun, clean, smart body care products. We are based out of Jhansi. Uh, please follow us on Instagram, Marceline, okay? So what we've been doing for customer retention is uh, building on customer experience and personal touch. I think the experience part I've seen really get ignored a lot. But right from when someone places an order from our website to when they receive it to the follow-up, we are always there. So for instance, when someone places an order, when they receive it, those 30 to 40 seconds we exclusively get with the customer. That is universally true. Each brand gets that attention. So in that time frame, how much can we connect with the person? I, for the first thousand customers, I've handwritten deep notes about you know, the journey of the brand and free samples and stickers and any accessories that are relevant at that time and also push the brand. Of course, these lead to further sales and queries, um, but I feel it doesn't always have to be just a transaction. If we do anything out of the brand's willingness to make the customer feel special, the customer notices that. I'll give you an example. I got a feedback uh, from a lady. I think she works at a bank. She was 40 years old and she's like, I have two kids and I was so exhausted throughout the day and when I got home, I got the package, I opened it and I felt like a princess. And that is exactly the kind of feeling which we are trying to give. You know, someone who caters to people throughout the day is being catered for like a minute or minute and a half without her asking for it. She, has, she just asked for the product. The experience we made extra. We put an extra effort towards that. The result of this is that I get phone calls or messages on the website, hi, I'm in Kanpur, uh, my friend's birthday, she's in Bangalore, can you ship that same product in the same way that you shipped it to me, to her? You know, or I'm traveling abroad, I need this product for five of my friends, the same way that you sent it to me. So I feel like that whole experience, people really appreciate that, the whole personal touch that I'm talking about. We just started our digital presence about six months ago, but before that, we used to do a lot of live exhibitions and pop-ups. So I did one two years ago at Jawaharlal Nehru Stadium in Delhi, I and my father. And uh, there was a doctor lady with a little son and the son was pulling her and yelling at her and at the same time, I was also explaining the product to her. 
So she was very patient with me and with the son and I said, uh, ma'am, you are such a patient mom, I love that about you. She didn't buy anything, she left. After two months, we got a message that um, it's my sister's wedding and I want 60 pieces of the same product. And I'm like, who are you? I don't know you. Have you ever tried our product? And she said, no, you remember you said I'm a patient mom, I'm that woman. And so, you know, if you try to connect with people, they do come back. Of course, the product has to be decent. It has to be good. That is a given. I'm just talking about the sticking to the brand. Like for Marceline, it should feel like a hug, right? From when you order to when you receive it to the follow-up. And that hug aspect has to be on our social media, through our WhatsApp marketing, through when we meet them. It has to be in our brand tonality and we always try to stick with it. So when that translates, India is an emotional country, people do connect, and that, that automatically starts building retention. So that is how we've been trying to go about it. Interesting, Niharika, good example. Samir, you've been representing uh, the, this particular category and you're a veteran in this for the last 20 years. Tell us about your uh, current uh, thing and how do you look at retention? Because yours is a services business. So, uh, for the audiences, uh, my name is Samir. Uh, I am the CEO of uh, one of India's largest uh, salon company, which is called Lux. We currently operate 225 salons in 52 cities. Uh, the brand is about 30, 35 years of uh, heritage. Primarily in the north of India, I am based out of Bombay building the new footprint as far as uh, emerging markets are concerned. Uh, Bhavesh has been kind enough to say, I've been in the beauty space for 20 years. I used to run uh, uh, companies like Kaya, VLCC, uh, boutique French company in Bombay called John claude Begin French Company uh, Salons. And now, recently, about a year and uh, three, four months ago, I have taken charge of uh, this new responsibility. So having spent time in the uh, industry for so many years, I think uh, in the physical services business, the only two reasons why a customer comes back is, is the two E's which I have learned in these years and I'll be happy to share, which is experience and expertise. Uh, experience, a lot of people have said here, I'm sure all of you also know. Uh, in the services industry, why would the lady sitting in the audience or here like to go back to the same hairdresser or like to go back to the same beautician is because of the expertise. Ours is a very, very I don't have a product which is the hero. My hero is the employee which works on the floor, which works on each one of you, cuts hair, colors hair, does a manicure, pedicure, basically hygiene services. And we are not in the specialized business, we are in a very hygiene business. Every 25, 30 days, people would invariably need to come to a salon. Also, uh, so how do we retain? I think. Everybody has heard all the use of technology, et cetera, et cetera. All of them, are, all of you sitting are very smart people. And that's why we are in this D2C summit. Uh, the only thing uh, which I would give as a wisdom in all my years is to share, uh, yes, technology plays a very important role because if you do not know and if you do not identify using CRM and uh, uh, seeing that who's due for a service, et cetera, et cetera, repeat rates, the usual uh, metrics of the business. But all, all said and done, I think what I've, I've realized and, and I want to build on as far as the businesses are getting more and more complex is to create personalized experiences. Uh, beyond just experiences, it is also about personalization now. And uh, that is what I will share as we come to the other part of uh, the That's conversation. Uh, so Samir, uh, you know, we've seen some very successful loyalty programs, you know, in the country, uh, even in the retail, you know, Shopper Stop uh, runs the first citizen loyalty program. And there are other successful programs, uh, you know, customer retention and loyalty, very important. So how do you feel, where do you see, uh, you know, loyalty as a, a very big aspect of customer retention because if you have loyal customers, retention becomes easy. So maybe if you can share your view on how loyalty can change the whole customer like retention. Like I said, uh, Bhavesh Shannon, and to all of you that uh, loyalty and loyalty programs are a part and parcel of the business, but they have evolved now. If you were running traditional programs, I don't think uh, they will do justice anymore. Uh, what ran 10 years ago, by Emirates, uh, on which I used to travel a lot when I was running 
a company called Kaya, is now very, is defunct. They have to evolve, they will have to move in with the audience, they will have to understand that how can they remain more competitive over Qatar Airlines, which is also offering the equally good services. Uh, so I think personalization, understanding your consumer profile, creating, not just having something on the menu that, you know, if you have so many points, this is what you can avail of, no. I think uh, also being very, very careful in terms of reaching out to your customer. It often happens with me, my name is spelt as S-A-M-I-R, but I get all messages which say S-A-M-E-E-R. It's not the fault of the person who's sending out the message, it's not a technology fault. You know, so if you, and that's what irritates me, I'm sure a lot of guys and ladies here at Starbucks would also get their names misspelled, right? And that pisses you off early morning on a flight. So it's not really the fault, it is the way we have to evolve, it is the way one has to train your uh, front office people to go a little more deeper, uh, to train your uh, uh, people to get the exact customer name and definition right, okay. so that personalization can start from the spelling, right? Mm. Instead, I often get messages from beauty companies which I've run, uh, where maybe, uh, you know, it's a female service and a message comes to men. And I'm sure I'm also goofing up. I'm not the only guy in town. I'm sure we are also making enough mistakes. But like I said, the only thing I'd like to give advice to all of you here is to keep improvising and keep detailing the customer profile far better than what is being done now. For that, you have to coach your CRM executive. So data uh, becomes yeah, yeah. very, very data important. Data is very, very important. But also, I'm saying the profiling of the consumer is very important. Correct. Incorrect email IDs. Because okay. you, you are offering up uh, services uh, and you should know, you know, what customer, which customer had what kind of services and what more can be offered to a particular customer. So I think loyalty uh, is a very big aspect uh, and then when we know that, you know, the profile of the customer is XYZ and how do I offer a ABC service which can be an additional problem. Absolutely right. Thank you. Anyone has any opinion around? The lady, they were smiling when I was making a Starbucks example. Right? Yeah. Sorry, with no, due, due, no, no ill feeling towards any Starbucks employee here. Or the yeah, but just anybody statement. wants to, uh, you know, put some uh, light on the loyalty as being an aspect of customer retention. If if anybody is there, the mic is around. If, if anybody wants to, let's make it more engaging. You know, it should not be a one-way thing. Uh, yeah. Yes, here. Hello, everyone. So, yes, uh, I would like to say that I am... Can uh, you introduce yourself? Uh, yeah. You represent uh, a yeah. brand. So, yeah, my name is Nishtha and I am the founder of First Shot. We are brand enablers, brand strategists. Uh, um, yes, I am a looks a loyal customer. So I got my first service from Lux in 2009, Noida Sector 18, wow. and it was smoothening, hair, hair smoothening, it was very much in trend <laughs> that, that uh, time. And those guys made me uh, buy shampoo, conditioner and everything. At that point of time I thought it may, might be an extra effort because of, you know, it, the shampoos costed somewhere around 2500 that time. Um, but uh, because, like you said, uh, the guy who did my hair smoothening is still the guy I go to whenever I'm there, I'm around, I get to get things. So yeah, loyalty is one thing which I'm very sure looks or any other brand should look for. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this. Paul, uh, uh, you represent Vesmai, which is an omni-channel. You already spoke <laughs> about, uh, you know, being an omni-channel brand. Uh, touch and feel is very important offline, online, uh, you know, again, that whole experience of making sure that online, offline experience is consistent, which definitely helps retain customers. So how do you think, you know, the whole omni-channel strategy for retaining a customer, right, like, like you mentioned, you know, we put QR codes at the stores to people go offline. Where do you see, you know, the areas where, you know, you feel that, you know, maybe uh, discounting is customer retention strategy or, uh, you know, making sure that, you know, some other aspect which can help you drive that whole omni-channel retention strategy, if you can share something around. 
So, see, as far as discounts are concerned, I feel like it's a very short-term strategy. It'll work for a few months. The moment someone else comes and gives a bigger discount, you're done. So, there's no retention in my opinion. It's, it's subjective. But it's, it's too short-term a value add and it's too much of a cost for you to get that much value. Because you're spending that much money on discounts and then they leave the moment they find someone else. And so for, a, for in our case, for example, our price uh, is about 1,000. It's between 1,000 to 5,000 is an average kurti price. So compared to if you look at overall India, it's a little bit on the higher side. It'll be mass premium. It'll be somewhere there. So in that segment, and generally when we do research, India below 1,000 online purchase is a lot easier for in general in India. About 1,000, it becomes a little bit more shaky. That's where I feel offline has helped us a lot. Because when a customer comes offline, there are two things that happen. One is the product, they touch and feel. They have the, you know, this product is good. They can understand the intricacies. So if you're selling, let's say, a kurti with a lot of intricate work on it, online doesn't really do any justice to what you're looking at. In online, a 1,000 rupee kurti and a 5,000 rupee kurti practically looks the same. The only thing you can do is change the background and, you know, put some more gold and all that and it'll look more fancier, that's it. So when they go offline, I feel that benefit helps us a lot in getting customers online. And the second is the experience, the store experience and the entire process of trust. See, essentially a brand is a trust. A brand is, we define in our company, a brand as some, a customer's trust on something. When you see a brand physically, it automatically brings a trust to the brand. That, okay, because every day you get online, you know, you browse through Google and suddenly you're getting sponsored ads from 10 companies on Instagram after that. So it's a very cluttered space after a point. When you see a brand offline, I feel it helps for them to be like, okay, you know, I've seen this brand when I went to uh, in Bangalore or when I went to Chennai, I saw this brand or in Hyderabad, I saw this brand. Oh, they are reliable. They are at scale. They're reliable. So I feel offline has significantly helped build that trust and then we want to convert that online. So once a customer, let's say, visits our store offline, that's where we try to make them be like, okay, you know, we have this much inventory, uh, ours is omni-channel, so it's the entire inventory from all the stores that are there online. So, so you, uh, your segment is uh, ethnic where a lot of D2C players are there in that segment. So you mean to say that, you know, the offline gives you that edge over customer retention because you can push those people from offline to online with whatever story, yeah. interesting. Anything else which you would want to stay? Yeah, so see, uh, again, that's an expensive one because setting up an offline channel is not easy. But I feel like longevity wise, offline has worked out better for us in terms of, let's say, investment versus the return and the customer life cycle value. Offline has, in our opinion, worked out better for us. Thanks. Kanchana, you represent a category, travel gear, uh, I think, and right. you work with almost all segments, which, which I say that, you know, whether it is travel, uh, even the brand-wise. So how do you think, you know, uh, from a customer segmentation point of view, uh, you think, you know, retention becomes important or what are the strategies which you think could be helpful? Sure. So uh, when you look at from the D2C point of view, because we have all the channel presence, but here I'm specifically talking about the D2C website. So when you do at a, some point, you, there is a break point where you say, okay, my acquisition is really not making a sense. I'm making top line, but am I making also on a bottom line? What is my profitability? Because the store does extremely well business because it's a, when you buy a luggage, you want to see it. You want to feel it and then you take a decision about buying it. So everything matters, your colors, your uh, what kind of a trend it is, whether it has a seasonality or not, what kind of a brand it is. And uh, also customer always look for something more. So, you know, if you don't build that loyalty, it is easy for people to shift from, you know, one place to another. I can tell you many stories where people have waited for inventory to go live again for a particular style. I'm talking specifically about Tommy. So they have waited for that style to go live. We have a particularly uh, uh, aluminum trunk, which is at 39,000, just the cabin luggage. So, you know, there was a customer who waited for us to make that particular SKU going live, then he bought it. So it is always an encouraging story when the customer writes on a, your website saying that, hey, I'm waiting for it, make it live. So these are the stories that you look for. And this is a customer that you want to make sure that they are there, they're traveling with you in your brand journey, you're telling them the right brand story, and you're making them to come back again and again. 
So uh, these are the things which uh, makes a difference and also, you know, looking at the data like, uh, you know, Samir talked about the loyalty program. We also launched our loyalty program for the same where you're satisfying your customer who is coming again and again and spending more and more with you. So uh, we launched a program called Bagline Select. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, you know, in your category, there have been players who've been there for ages. Uh, and then we have the new age brands like the Makovara, Assembly, Upper Crayers, and so on, Nasher Miles. These are the new age brands. So where do you think that product differentiation is a, is a, a strategy for retention? Or uh, you think that, you know, the new age brands are competing uh, from a price point uh, perspective? So in a D2C, there's always a fight about, you know, what discounting. But if you get into that the same discounting rut, then probably you will not able to survive. Which I was talking about, you know, acquisition, you spend so much uh, marketing money on Meta and Google, and then you end up learning that, oh, you're not making money. Mm -hmm. So these kind of a business will not last very long. If you look at the newer segment, which are coming into a price point of, you know, Safari. So they are actually not hitting into our, or they're not biting us in our uh, brand level. But if you talk about Samsonite, I never seen, you know, Samsonite or a Tommy or such brands going behind the discounting. Instead of that, we want to give a better experience to the customer, making sure that the customer is satisfied and he's coming back for his other requirements like a backpack or a belt and a wallet or a handbag. So then there is a plethora of things. And also we cater to different uh, age group, like, you know, Tommy is for a Evolve customer. We have Aeropostal, which is for Zen Z. Then we have a mass segment, which is into, uh, you know, United Colors of so Benetton. catering different segments uh, yes. with, with the... Yes. So that stra strategy works for us. Thanks. Sagar, uh, again, coming back to you, uh, you know, uh, data in your business is very important. I think because you deal with uh, a product, snacking product, which is distributed across the geographies. I don't, you, uh, do you operate Pan-India or uh, you operate in region? Yeah, we have been uh, present across uh, geographies. Now majorly we are trying to kind of go deeper in south and west, but yeah, we have had like, you know, at one point we were there in almost 30 odd cities. So uh, like you said, you are available on quick commerce uh, and quick commerce is a new age uh, channel, you know. A uh, lot of uh, insights uh, uh, you get through data because you know which customer is buying or which area is getting the maximum orders. Uh, so how do you think, uh, you know, data can play a very important role in customer retention? and then plan your whole, uh, uh, you know, product accordingly? Uh, to be honest, I think, you know, while we were operating uh, primarily on D2C, that time we, were, we had access to a lot of data, possibly, and now it's, it's exactly the opposite when we operate in general trade or even quick commerce. It's actually the lack of data, you can say, possibly. Okay. That is possibly biting us more because we don't like the kind of things that we want to analyze, we are possibly not able to do that. We have to, uh, in fact, uh, kind of, you know, draw inferences or, you know, build hypothesis basis what we have. Like, uh, supposedly, you know, we are selling to, our customers are not the, the end consumers in that case. It's majorly the distributors and the, the super stockist and, you know, the retailers. So there's a, there's a whole chain that kind of goes on. So how in a specific area the, you know, uh, the repeats are happening, the, the, you know, the, the order from a super stockist is going up, uh, the frequency is going up. For a retailer, the drop size, which is like every time, uh, you know, a sales officer goes, what is the order that he's taking? So, while, we, you know, we have seen that our orders have, you know, one drop size for a very small Parchuni store has gone up from, you know, 450 rupees to say 750 rupees. So that, that kind of gives us an, you know, idea that, you know, this catchment area where this retail store or a small uh, standalone modern trade is catering to, this, because, you know, the, the repeats are happening or the consumers are buying it again, uh, with an assumption that, you know, there is not, you know, a, uh, you know uh, influx of a new consumers in this area, just because this is a, uh, a fixed store, so people must be buying in that locality. So, so these are the kind of inferences that we kind of are able to draw. Similarly, in quick commerce, we don't get consumer data. We don't have their phone numbers, we don't have their mail address, we don't have their age, anything. So quick commerce does not give you access to any data. So again, it's more about, you know, which 
city is kind of performing well? Is the city has improved or something? How individual dark stores are performing? Again, there is limited data, data that we get uh, because a lot of logistics happen in, in, internally. So again, that's, that's what we have been kind of you know, facing, to be honest, as a challenge that you know, we don't really get uh, access to a lot of data and the consumer profiling, which I feel that uh, should improve in you know, coming uh, you know, time in you know, next five to 10 years is actually where I feel that there is a lot of scope of you know, building out uh, uh, tools, leveraging AI and multiple kind of you know, technology aspects to actually build in some intelligence that you know, what catchment areas you're getting a better uh, you know, uh, uh, demand and you know, uh, how your beat, which is like, you know, how your route of, you know, touching the retail stores in a day should look like for a sales officer. Uh, if, if there can be a, you know, differentiated price strategy for different areas as well, uh, that can be done. If there can be a personalized experience that can be created. If certain set of retailers are performing differently from, a, you know, uh, other set of retailers or, you know, for a dis on a distributor level, what data can be kind of accessed more? Uh, because these are very traditional people, you can say, who have been in, in, in business for, in India for a long time. So even the distributors are not very equipped with, with you know, a lot of tools, data, and you know, multiple kind of softwares. So I think, I think there is a lot of scope which I feel that you know, is there and should come in, in future. But honestly, at the moment, it's actually a challenge for us that you know, we are not having that access. I think that. there might be some uh, enablers in the audience who would be from, uh, you know, providing services around data, analytics, retention. Anybody wants to share around this? Any enabler who would want to? Hello, good evening. Uh, I'm not an enabler actually as such. I'm, I'm representing a B school. Uh, I am a marketing faculty in that B school. What I understand that uh, I think uh, the panel has been quite uh, right on uh, hitting the bullseye that, okay, fine, if you are, uh, uh, discounting is not a permanent solution towards gaining a lot of uh, uh, retention or gaining a lot of loyalty because you are continuously subsidizing your customers. So the reference pricing which is there at the mindset, it gets lost over a period of way and the customer starts thinking that your product is as valued at that discounted price. So that is absolutely not done. But what I believe is creates is that overall experience of the journey of the customer through the different customer touch points which your uh, company might have created. And here the essence of data comes that the data needs to be shared very seamlessly across these touch points. For example, I'm calling a call center that okay, fine, I'm trying to locate your nearest store. Right, the call center says, okay, sir, this is the nearest store. Now, if that particular data that, yes, there was an inquiry regarding the nearest store, the store manager has to be absolutely ready and whatever merchandise that person is interested in, that merchandise needs to be displayed and that merchandise needs to be presented in front of that. So, when the customer visits the store so from, from online to offline, so this experience of the customer when he visits the store, he understands the store is in a frame of mind to present him that particular merchandise to try to enumerate what are the benefits of this merchandise. So he gets that particular experience. And I think that trades off between, because today you see the customer is looking for convenience, one hand, and the customer is looking for authenticity, on the other hand. Now how to trade off? If for con convenience, I need to have the product delivered at my doorstep. And for uh, authenticity, I need to have a touch feel, and for that Indian customers even sniff and lick, right? So this is, this is how Thank the Indian consumers would like to but test the products through five senses. So in between that, I think that omni-channel, where the essence of omni-channel is coming and the seamless sharing of data is coming. And that needs to be absolutely immaculate in giving that overall experience of the customer throughout his journey. Thank you. Thank you. Niharika, uh, you know, in today's age, it's creator economy. We say that, you know, content is commerce now. And uh, over the last two days, you know, we saw a lot of things being spoken around how content can become a useful tool for enabling uh, business or sales uh, in, in today's, in the D2C segment. You know, where do you see the whole shift of, you know, digital media playing an important role in, uh, you know, customer retention? Maybe, you know, some of your customers become brand advocates. Uh, 
uh, and then they start creating, uh, you know, content which is uh, about your brand. So where do you see the whole digital media shift in customer attention? All right, thank you for your question, sir. I feel like a brand is an entity, right? It has a way it talks, a way it walks, a way it responds. There's, there, even in your ad copies, there's a tonality that you maintain. So that brand, that entity reacts in a certain way to different situations. It doesn't dilute itself, it doesn't dissolve itself wherever it, go, wherever it goes. So your Instagram feed or your Facebook feed is a very good way to visually show the personality and that entity which your brand is embodying. Of course, you also have to have something special to say as a brand. The pictures, the aesthetic, the vibe, the colors, the fonts, everything has to have a sense of cohesion. That is a brand. Social media is a beautiful way to convey that. At Marceline, we use social media for two things. One is to share the vibe, the vibe, so to say. How does one feel when they see the page? People who resonate with the vibe end up following. Those are our new, new watchers, I would say, not customers as of now. The second thing, how we use it as, is a reality TV show. We show a lot of behind the scenes, trends, we ask a lot of questions, business insights, setbacks. People start relating with that and they start becoming a part of the journey. So with the vibe, you acquire someone and with the story, you retain someone. That's how they start adding up to the line of potential customers. What happens is slowly, slowly, if I say someone's been following my page for a month, but they haven't made a purchase, if I ever leverage a video testimonial, that is just that extra push that they needed to make that purchase. So video testimonials, user generated content, which is if someone's buying regularly, you know, you can pitch to them or offer an additional discount in exchange of a video or short clip of how they use the product or what they like about it. And then you can promote that on your page. And people trust each other. How someone shoots the video, what is their background, kind of shows the audience the customer persona. And if they relate with it, they end up making that purchase. So it's quite, a, quite an interesting way to acquire consistent customers, to show your journey, to show it as a film, uh, oftentimes people don't buy from your website, but we are at a few cafes, niche cafes in Delhi, they end up picking the thing from there because they follow it on social media or from some of our pop-ups. So where the conversion will happen, you don't know. But if you strategically and consistently keep on coming in front of them, and of course with authenticity, with what, with what you stand for, it does lead to very healthy conversions. I have, we launched about a year and a half ago and there have been loyalists from day one, some of them. And now it has come to a point where people are asking, when are you coming out with new products? This is a problem that we have, can you work on this? So this is a nice validation for the brand that people are already, they've been following it, they like the story, they have this problem, they want to see this brand's version of the answer for this. You know, and this only happens when you, like I said, consistently and strategically keep on coming in front of them. So those are a few things which Interesting I facts, you. you know. Uh, finally, we have about two minutes uh, and before we wind up, uh, we'll open up. But just want to understand, you know, from anybody uh, in the panel, you know, ethical practices uh, and transparency. See, uh, many a times you receive an email which says that, you know, uh, this is a special offer for you. But then it's connected with a star star which says that if you do this, then you do that. So, uh, you know, uh, being uh, transparent about, uh, you know, your uh, uh, customer retention strategy is very important. Anybody can take this question. Where do you think? You know, Samir, in your... So I think uh, it's important. So you will have to look at the ROI for the service provider also. So I, while I will give out a complimentary service, but then there is a cost of doing business. I'm already discounting that, There's a, especially for fixed cost businesses like ours. So if there is a slight rider, you have to be upfront and tell it. I mean, you can't yeah. then later on say, no, 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 this, this is what happened. Yeah, many a times it happens that you receive an SMS or a I think today email. Indian consumers are very open. It's be transparent with them, tell them these are the uh, uh, these are the terms, this is what the right is, this is a great personalized offer for you, however it comes at this cost. I think it's best to be open and 
and very true. Uh, uh, honest about it anybody else wants to share uh, around uh, you know ethical practices and transparent being transparent about what you want to offer to retain the customer so i think it is very important how frequently you touch base with your customer it should not be look like you're spamming the customer or you're intruding in their life so you need to be consistent but not uh, you know intruding secondly it is also important what kind of a messaging or what kind of a communication that you're doing with the customer is it a brand story or it is some random sale uh, thing that you're offering so these things do matter and uh, i think you need to use data wisely most of the things works around a personalization rather than just looking at it as a di data absolutely data plays a very important role and the personalized offers which you create is very important thanks uh, i think any questions uh, because we are about to wind up uh, one at the back. Nish, have you allowed one question? <laughs> hey, hi. Uh, this is Utkarsh. I'm from the Broadway team. Can you um, be a little louder? Hi, I'm Utkarsh. I'm uh, from the Broadway team. And uh, I have a question for the panel. Since uh, most of you are omni-channel, right? So typically, in online, we have retargeting as a, as a very important measure. And even for retention, we tend to retarget customers that you know have already been changed. Has anybody uh, tried aggressively on online, offline retargeting? Maybe it's pin code based, uh, where typically for a brand, which is uh, present everywhere, versus where you're present offline as well. Is there an impact on the ROI you see, or are there any strategies that have been explored in this area? So what he means is that, you know, uh, targeting us a particular area, offline, online, how do you, so maybe uh, if you can. Uh, sure. Let me take a quick example. Let's say you're present in Delhi or, or let's say Mumbai in multiple pin codes of Pawai, right? Let's say in multiple nature basket, right? And you do your online spends uh, for your D2C channels, but is there an uptake in sales or in the ROAS of the ad spends? where you're present uh, heavily offline versus where you're not present offline? So can so I I'll, take I'll this? answer the offline bit. I think uh, we do this and we find a definite ROI uh, for sure. But ours is more of a habit, so where the customer is used to coming to uh, a physical premise and getting it done. But I think it's a combination which works. We definitely see ROI where majority of our business is, is driven by repeats, you know. So uh, we, uh, we are an omni-channel uh, business and uh, there are some, uh, you know, dealers and distributors segment or your large format retailers where you don't get the data points from. So what we use, you know, since we are talking about the high value luggage, we started using warranty as a good tool and working around it. So it is little tedious, but we do get the data from everywhere and we also use offline marketing data or my EBO or, a, you know, DND data to retarget the online customer, to get the customer to see my uh, product display pages. And uh, the conversion from uh, retargeting campaign is much higher than, you know, uh, acquiring a new customer. So uh, that was your point, right? I think uh, we are already time up. Anish is uh, already looking at me and saying signal. signal. Thanks. Thank you, everyone.